the colonies, they understood it. It was because of the Puritans. Now, the Puritans were fallible people. The church fathers were fallible people. They were just as flawed as everyone sitting in this room. But they did something really wonderful. And they did something really wonderful because they were committed to great ideals. When people are committed to great ideals and united around those great ideals, then really wonderful things, really good things can happen. I find that encouraging because I fall under that category of a flawed human being, but I believe that God wants me to do something good with my life. And if I commit myself to good ideals, to good values, then that can happen. The title of the sermon today is Symbols of Our Freedom. We're going to talk about three symbols, three values that these founding fathers had, and I believe if we grab and embrace those values in our life, that it will make a difference in our lives, make a difference in the lives of our family, and I think it will make a difference in the corner of the world, wherever our corner of the world is. We have a symbol for each. The first one is Patrick Henry. There's a picture of Patrick Henry right there. There he is. Patrick Henry was a great man of conviction. Not every founding father was a Christian, but Patrick Henry was most assuredly. He was a Bible-believing Christian who his faith was very important to him. And your first blank here is that just as Patrick Henry was a person of great conviction, God has called us to be people of great conviction. In 1775, March 23rd, 1775, Patrick Henry addressed the delegates of Virginia to try to get them to join in the, uh, the rebellion against the British Empire. And this is where he gave his famous speech. I'm going to read a part of that speech. I won't read it all because it was very long. They were very long-winded back then. But this is what he says. He says, there is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? Is life so dear or peace so sweet? as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery, forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or... You've heard that one, huh? It's a famous speech. Patrick Henry was quite the orator. And they said by the, the end of this speech, he was yelling at the top of his lungs, and he was pounding on the table where he was standing. But Patrick Henry was a person of great conviction. There's no doubt in this speech where he stands about anything. This, this political ideal of liberty and freedom and self-determination meant more to him than life himself. He was a person of great conviction. I believe we, who are as followers of Christ Jesus, we need to be people of great conviction. Who among people, if not us, should be people who have great conviction. And we are people of great conviction because we know who we are, which is your next blank in your outline there. I don't have to live a life of insecurity, of, of self-doubt, of, of a constant identity crisis because in Christ Jesus, I know who I am. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Who am I? I am chosen by God. I am part of His holy people. I am a royal priesthood. In the natural, I'm not a royal anything. I might be a royal pain sometimes. I don't know. But I traced my family back to a bunch of hillbillies in Tennessee. And then before that, a bunch of potato farmers in Scotland. No royalty here, but in Christ Jesus, I am part of a royal priesthood. And He has called me out of darkness into light, that my life might display the praises of Him who created me. Let that sink in a little bit. 
For those of us who have some insecurities, anybody out there with any insecurities? Anybody besides me? Okay. Let's read that one more time. Let it sink in. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. This is good stuff. This is better than winning the Super Bowl. This is better than winning Wimbledon, the U.S. Open, the Indy 500, and whatever else there is out there to win all in one year. This is a life changer. God has endued us with dignity. And because of that dignity that He has endued us with, we can live a life of confidence and we can live a life of conviction. We can live a life that declares the praises of Almighty God, of a, of a higher calling than that. We know where we are. We know where we're going. 2 Corinthians 5.1 says this, now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. I have this promise. I have this promise of eternity. It is greater than anything else. It is waiting for me. Just think of the, the great lengths that people go to to extend their lives. Probably on the extreme end, there is this process called cryonics. It's the freezing the body after death with the hope that someday they'll be able to thaw you out and bring you back to life. Now, they don't call it freezing. They call it something else. But somehow they, they pump this stuff into you and they put you into the liquid nitrogen and it preserves your body supposedly unharmed. With the hope and the thought that someday that science will reach the point where they can revive you and bring you back to life. It's not cheap. It's $200,000 for a full body freeze. Ted Williams, the great baseball player, is now in frozen in liquid nitrogen in a stainless steel container at the Life Extension Foundation in Arizona. If you're more of an economical cryonic shopper, they will freeze your head for only $80,000. With the hope someday that they will discover how the brain can regrow a body, is what they say on their website. I was on their website the other day. You must think I had too much time on my hands, right? <laughs> but we have a gift of eternal life that God has given to us through Christ Jesus, through the death and resurrection. God knows how to resurrect the dead. I don't believe we ever will. God knows. He promises eternal life. So the big question in life that we have, that's already been answered. I don't have to worry about what happens after I die. I can live a life of confidence. I can live a life of conviction. I can live a life that shows forth the praises of Almighty God. Not only do we know where we're going, but we know how to live. Romans 12 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul says, and he's writing the book of Romans, he says the only possible the only logical response to all that God has done is for us to give ourselves fully over to Him. That's the only possible thing we can do. There's no other decision that can logically or, or possibly be made with any type of understanding of what's happened. And He says, don't be, trans don't be conformed to this world. But be transformed. We can't go with the flow. We have to stand up and say, I'm a person of conviction. And God has told me how to live. And I will live that way. Here's a picture of a t-shirt that I like. All the fish are going one way, but there's the little Christian fish symbol. He is going the other way. Sometimes that's how it is. Maybe we need to borrow a line from Patrick Henry. 
He says, I know not what course others may take. But as for me, I will speak about other people with respect. I won't gossip. I don't know about others, but I will live a life of honesty and personal integrity. I don't know about others, but I'll live a life of sobriety. I will live a life of integrity, and I will live a life of sexual purity. I don't know what others are going to do, but that's what God has called me to do. And he has empowered me to do so. But I can't go along with the flow. I cannot be afraid to stand alone. Because if I want to follow God, there are times where I have to stand alone. Or I'll say, I don't know what others are going to do, but this is what I'm going to do because this is what God has told me, the life that God has called me to live. God has called us to be a people of great conviction. Secondly, God has called us to be a people with a great message. And the symbol there is the liberty bell. The liberty bell. There it is. Liberty Bell is the, the great symbol of, of the struggle for freedom among the colonies. It was wrong July 8th when they uh, gathered the people to read the Declaration of Independence. It was wrong at the First Continental Congress. It was wrong at the Battle of Lexington and Concord. And later in 1837 it became the symbol adopted by the American Anti-Slavery Society. So it's a a bell that has great symbolism of freedom and equality. But in actuality, as a bell, it's not that good a bell. See the big crack in there? Bells aren't supposed to have cracks in them. In fact, the city of Philadelphia bought this bell in, in 1751. They paid 100 pounds for it, which was a lot of money back then. Had it, had it forged in England, they brought it over hung it on scaffolding, the entire community, the entire city came to hear the bell ring. The first time the clacker hit the bell, cracked it, and it was, it was no good. They had to, to melt it down, and they had to re-found it, and then they rang it, it sounded so bad, they had to